with Matthew Clemens, Joe Menza, and me, Andrew Broussard. Today, we are going to talk about our palate and palate progression. Uh, let's start with the man, Matthew Clemens himself, or just uh, say hi, and we'll get flowing into things. My palate progression? Well, hello. How's it going, guys? It, it's been all, we've let the whole summer go by since the last time that we were on. And the reason why is because I've largely unplugged. Um, I took kind of a break from Facebook and stuff. But uh, the palette, I pretty much copied Stephen Cronin's palette. I mean, the manner in which he arranges his palette. And I still use the Cotman Ron Ranson palette. Oh, uh, before you go into that, um... I remember last time we had talked, you said your first time really purchasing watercolor was in like a like a, a supermarket. Yeah, so I bought a I bought a really cheap, uh, not even student grade, like what you would consider like party favor grade um, watercolor set, and I tried to get in and manage like whatever it was, thirty colors or something like that, and it, everything looked so terrible. And I didn't have any control of the water and the the color, or, or I had no idea what I was doing. But I could I could tell enough that the colors were no good. That it, like this was terrible stuff. How long do you think you were, I guess, floundering with that um, beginner palette? I didn't uh, flounder for more than five days before before I got on Amazon and ordered the right stuff. Really. Really, so, because I was, because I ran into the, you know, Stephen Cronin's tutorials and, and thought, wait a second, and the three demos, Ron Ranson's three demos. And, okay, I, and I was like, okay, I, these are, I'm going to, I'm moving this way because it's regimented. My belief is, is if, if somebody else has done the experimenting on which ones you use, you, you're going to get, get there quicker because you don't have to put thought into to that um, you can just zone in on the techniques and composition stuff and not worry so much about the, the color of the palette and that's that's still really where I am I, I mean I would like sometimes to stray away from Ron Ranson's palette um, and I do every once in a while but I almost never pick it up and continue with it why don't we see how um Joe got to the Ron Ransom palette as well, because I know that's where we're all going to pretty much converge. Um, and, and I think it's going to be the main topic, like using the colors and maybe how we then strayed a little bit from there or stayed within it. So I'm curious, like Joe had a job within art. I don't know if he wants to share that with us or not, right? Like, I mean, one of your first, even going back to high school and college, you had a whole- Yeah, I was, uh, I, I was in uh, graphic arts, which, was more like printing. It didn't really involve the freedom of art necessarily, but uh, it did give me a crash course on colors and combinations, things like that. So, but it was limited because you were given what you had to reproduce and, you know, it, there was no creative side to it. So yeah, I was, uh, you know, I was familiar with magenta, cyan, you know, yellow, black, and the combination of colors. Uh, and uh, that was through like printing, but you know, we called it graphic arts because there were a lot of facets to it. And I was in that for a number of years, but my experience with the painting is, well, actually I should say before I was painting model figures, like those vinyl ones you had to put together from the movies. And I was using uh, flesh tones and different colors like that for painting. So I had that experience, but when I went from oils to acrylic to watercolor, I actually went in that order because I got that gifted that Bob Ross set. Um, I didn't like the oils and all that. So I went to the store and I just bought one of those little strips. I mean, there was, there was like five, six colors in there. It was just a little plastic $2 deal. And I sat down, I was playing, I said, this looks like fun, but I mean, it seemed like a kid type thing. And I was not really aware that there was people doing, you know, high end stuff with watercolor. So that's when I tuned in again, my experience was similar. I found uh, Frank Clark and a few other people. So I adopted their palettes, but I very quickly made a couple of changes because I just, 
it's just how I am. I, I experiment with a lot of things. And I went with yellow ochre and because I had played around with the Bob Ross stuff, I'm like, well, I really wanted to know what some of the other blues were and uh, the, the yellow ochre. I threw that in there while everybody was using lemon yellow or cad yellow hue. I threw in yellow ochre and it kind of gave my paintings a little bit different of a look right from the get-go. Then of course I started hearing about, you're not supposed to use white, which made me immediately want to see why and try it. <laughs> so, yeah. but from there, I mean, as I stick with mostly the original palette, but I kind of did a little Bob Rossification because I did put Van Dyke Brown. I said, let's see what sap green can do. And, you know, some of those other colors I wanted to see. And this is building off of just the kind of strip tube that you had bought, just the generic? No, the first thing I bought was the strip and then those few colors. And then I said, you know, knowing people the way they are, there's got to be people out there that are doing this to the nth degree. And so that's when I sought it out and I found, I'm like, this comes in tubes. And that's when I bought the first <laughs> tubes, you know. I, I do it. I actually had something like that happen as well. But like, as a, as a grown adult, I think we all seem to have that same mindset where we, we saw the store brand and then we jumped into seeing what other people were doing. But how, uh, so uh, Matthew, you were what, you said five days about with your yeah. store brand? Yeah, I was really determined. I mean, I, I wanted to, it was, it was winter time and my, you know, my business gets really slow. Uh, after Christmas and all of that. And so it was one of those things. It, it, I just really wanted to figure out how to get it done. And it, the timing was there to where I saw the, these uh, YouTube tutorials. And, you know, I could have gone a different way. You know, <laughs> I could have gone the Steve Mitchell way. But I um, really just, I think because I have kind of a short attention span when I sit down to do my tasks, I want to I start something and finish it. Um, but I have a, a, I can persevere doing the same thing for a long period of time, at, you know, breaking it up in intervals at daily. Like I can stay on the palette consistently for months because the activity was so boiled down to a quick in and out activity. Yeah. So, okay. So you, you said five days internet and then like i like, so your your mindset you really just dove deep you said winter months right yeah um, so you were just like in the right time right place for all of that to concur yeah. to occur yeah um, the timing was all there that that's just the way it happened um, and then with yeah i'm sorry it, i'm i it's i i have one or two palette innovations i i keep like a, a little triad of to make my darks with i thought i was going to show y'all but uh i basically just dump um light red ultramarine and uh burnt umber on the different corners of this bowl and re-wet it and when when it's time for me to go back into my painting and put in my darks i get after this really thick juicy stuff and i just <laughs> replenish it often and there ends up being enough like free liquid that hangs around in the bottom to where I can pick up and almost, it's almost like a, like an ink that I can use on the rigor. Um, but that's one thing, the one palette type thing that I have done is this, is this guy right here. Great idea. Was that before you went into Ron Ranson or after you kind of no, ran into that? I just now start, I started doing this probably about, I don't know, a year ago, I started getting frustrated that my I, I couldn't get my darks quick enough, you know, because I when you're using the Ron Ranson palette, you know that if you want to get really quick, heavy darks, it can turn muddy, muddy fast, real muddy, and then end up becoming chalky as it dries. So I was getting frustrated with that. So I, I devised this this thing on how I was going to keep, you know, three dark. My dark little my dark triad if you will of light red ultramarine and burnt umber um to where it's super rich super thick super heavy and it not be like a big waste of paint and and this is what i came up with and oh, let's um 
let's go back to 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 Joe real quick. Um, because now that we're talking about the Ron Ransom pallet, was there anything else that led you up to it, Joe, before we start going into detail with the Ron Ransom pallet itself? Um, um I mean, I jumped into Ron Ranson pretty quick and started watching his videos. And I mean, I, I said to myself, if they're doing it, like Matt said, I wanted to do exactly what they were doing. Uh, you know, if it was working for them, I want to do, I want to reproduce exactly what they're doing, but it wasn't long. Like I say, before I started trying some other things because ultramarine blue by itself is a good color, but like you can only get so far with that. And if you look ahead, in Ron Ranson's later books, you'll notice he yeah. added other blues. And so yeah. if you want to start make, making more diverse skies, you're going to need a couple more blues. So I started doing this thing where I had three yellows, three blues, three reds. I had like three of each kind just for diversification, but it does get a little, it does get a little, you know, too much to have too many colors. So there's something to be said about the simplicity. You know, so, and I kind of go back to that simplicity. That that's the reason why I I I'm stuck on that palette. I don't want to say stuck, but I got whenever I feel like I'm getting uh, discouraged or whatever, I go back to the basic simplistic thing, and that's uh, that basic palette and really easy stuff to try to. I think it's just mental when. You go back to the basics and you see that you can do it easily and quickly and without stress and frustration. It builds up your esteem a little more to advance again a little further. Well, look, let me uh, interject. So looks like, I mean, we're, we're, we're at the Ron Ransom palette now historically for us, right? We've kind of jumped ahead a little bit with um, mixing some darks and then uh, some other colors that we've added. Why don't we go through the Ron Ransom palette color by color talk about our usage from there, and then from there, um, see how we added on to it. You okay. think that'd be a good flow of conversation? So the so the Ron Ranson palette is ultramarine blue. Uh, lemon the, yellow. Lemon yellow or cat yellow, some kind of middle of the road yellow. Um, raw sienna. No. Sorry, uh, uh, burnt umber. Yeah, burnt umber, raw sienna, a lizard and crimson, and light red and Payne's gray. Oh yeah, raw sienna, right? Raw sienna, yeah. Sorry, I was thinking burnt sienna. <laughs> no, that's uh, that's one of the acceptable early. That was probably Ron's first add-on, really. I think. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. well, why so, don't we yeah. talk about the 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 initial palette? Don't and forget a lizard we'll, and crimson, a lizard and crimson, and uh, light red. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about this original palette. Um, how you guys utilized it and where you diverged from there. So why don't we start with ultramarine blue because uh, Joe, you were, you were talking about that and you were saying that ultramarine blue is relatively limited or you started feeling that in some regard, right? Well, so ultramarine blue is, is, while it's a really good color, you can mix a lot of other things and make a lot of other colors out of it. I was watching other artists uh, and I notice a lot of them will use cobalt, cobalt, Prussian blue, phthalo blue, you know, there's, and you can really get some different skies out of that. And they mix differently. And I'm kind of like, I'm constantly experimenting anyway. So I'm always, you know, you buy these sets sometimes and they have these other colors in there and it's like, somebody must be using them. So I'll, somebody, I'll try them, you know? Yeah. You got to find what works for you. Um, I, the cobalt blue, I, I use cobalt. If I'm if I'm to stray and go off on another blue, I find that you have to have cobalt. Um, the Prussian blue, I did not like using the Prussian blue. I felt like it was so fierce, definitely moody, and but it was a little bit too powerful for my taste, and it stuck around on my palate. So I never did go try to did go back to that to Prussian. Great for winter scenes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And not not North Texas winter scenes. Um, <laughs> which I which I that I do, you know, North Texas winter scenes are more like little bits of uh Payne's gray, but lots of light red and blue and not not Russian that dark aqua colory. I don't know what it is, but 
it's 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 really overpowered like what i tried when i was trying to use it well, if i understand correctly um prussian blue is it's kind of on the greener side of things right yeah and i think that the old masters had it on their palette and then there was kind of a transition to the the thalo blue which is just so intense um wow. I tried thallow blue as well, and I and that was also kind of too intense for me. Very staining. Staining, staining, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, to, to kind of fire at you with ultramarine blue, uh, Matt, if you had to pick one brand, what's your go-to brand for ultramarine blue? I, man, I like um, the American Journey ultramarine blue from um, Cheap Joe's. Really? Do we know who makes American Journey? I, I think we decided that it was Da Vinci or whoever makes Da Vinci's watercolors makes American Journey's watercolor. There's a, yeah, I was gonna say, the Cheap Joe's I like Da Vinci. Blue. Yeah, Da Vinci is I my- I haven't even tried Da Vinci. I'd blue. like that. I mean, that this, makes this, me wanna this try this it. This one right here, this uh, American Journey Ultramarine Blue. Comes it is a good blue. 37 mil, it, the value, the intensity is there, and it's a, it's a really rich uh, paint. It's, it's nice to work neat. It works neat really well. It doesn't get so, you know, clumpy, like Cot Cotman sometimes won't, won't spread out very well. Uh, <clears throat> this is my favorite, second being the Cotman. Okay, so uh, Joe, for all the sponsorships in the world, because we're <laughs> up and coming artists, right? And we got to have fun with this, right? We want to, um, we're, we're the bell of the ball right now. We got Joe Menza. Yes, sir. What's what? the <laughs> Yeah. If you want to, you want to give us two brands or would you want to give us one brand? Who would you go, Ultramarine Blue? <clears throat> I mean, really, I mean, Daniel Smith really is like a really good brand to paint. I mean, it's just price wise. I know not a lot of people that are beginners are going to go for that. So I tend to go more to the student grade to get beginners hooked on. And I think if you talk to most professional artists, you'll find, you know, if money is not an object, then they'll go for something like a, a Daniel Smith. Daniel Smith, their colors are really good. The other ones that are good, I'll throw a, a wild card in there is Core, Q-O-R, Core. Very, very intense. If you're looking for really intense pigments, very good brand. But Daniel Smith all the way around. And then of course, Cotman would be, but you know, I've gone the whole gamut of like the cheapest paints I could find all the way up because mm -hmm. I know people are going to go into a Hobby Lobby or something like that, or, or, or Walmart even, and they're going to buy like those in more inexpensive paints. So I try to make those work so people can have some early success when they try to paint. I yeah. love the Cotman brand. Uh, I mean, Cotman, I've never... I, I've never found like Cotman to be deficient for me. Um, you know, uh, the and other brands, like the other cheap student brands, I have found inconsistencies. Never I, I should, we should add one quick thing is that if you're following the Ron Ranson palette, as we know, <laughs> that Windsor and Newton's the only one to get the light red that Ron Ranson used in those English landscapes. Yep. So there's a reason to buy the Windsor and Newton because that light red that he used is, is only really available in that line. Yeah. I, I, know that. I use it extensively. You want to talk about light red? Um, yeah. I, I, I use it extensively. I, 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 at first, when I first started painting, it used to kind of scare me to get into that light red. It's so powerful, but now I, I use it really, really liberally. Uh, comparatively to how I used to use it, you know, like a brownish red. Yeah, like I can iron blood red kind of thing. Yeah, I could talk all day about light red. I mean, you guys know that I moved into the direction of a lot of one to, uh, tube, two tube, or just triad paintings. But light red, um, at first I was a little timid with it, with the opacity, but I absolutely love it. Light red mixed with um, ultramarine blue for that oh. gifted hill purple. James Fletcher Watson. Hmm. 
it's the best. I mean, light red and, and ultramarine blue are is our roads, pathways, clouds, it, you know, distant hills, distant foliage. That combination is just, it's so versatile. Interestingly, if you go to Hobby Lobby and you buy their master touch brand, which this I have in my hand, they have the light red too. And we've kind of Matthew and I have talked about where we think these paints might be coming from, but we're not 100% sure, but they have the light red, just yeah. like the Cotman. And they're, the, the Master's Touch are very similar to Cotman, although sometimes they're not too well mixed in the tube. But I do like these paints, just I, as an inexpensive I, yeah, brand. I, I like them all right, too, Joe. Have you, have you found that they kind of, like, once you get them all mixed up, it's like the tube's only, like, half full? Do you well, know? You don't get yeah, and I mean, the they body. switched from this aluminum tube that bends to this like kind of vinyl tube. I don't know if you can see that, but what I do when I get the tube is I kind of do this sort of squeezing thing to kind of mix it up a little bit because sometimes I think it separates a little. But as far as an inexpensive, I mean, these are like three bucks when they're on sale. Yeah. How many ounces is that? They this say is, 21 uh, mil. Yeah, 21 mil. And I mean, these are great for starters. Just you get that separation. You can mix these in the tube. And uh, I haven't really found a, a problem with using them. I mean, they're great to get on sale and just great for practicing, you know. Just, I've, had, uh, I've had some really poor, poor product consistency with those lately um, to where it's like it's, it's just gunk that pours out of the, the tube. Just really quick to interject for people that are watching um, uh, at a later date, you know. So uh, you were talking price at Hobby Lobby, uh, $3 on sale for 21 ounce uh, milliliters. That's about the same size as the large cotton tube, which you would find for 5 or $6, right, on Blick or Jerry's or Cheap Joe's. There's yeah, and you can you can go to like Michael's. They used to have carry. I don't know if they, they still have cotton. In. I think they do. Yeah, and, they you do. know, you get one of those coupons for 50% off and do like Matthew used to do and go there once a day and get a tube a <laughs> yeah. day. Yeah, right? I just get my my daily coupon. You know, that's a that's a good topic too. Is how do you get into this without breaking the bank and still having enough uh, material to work with to where you're not miserly with it? You know, do you think um, that's a conversation for another day? That's Can an entire. I think that's. I think we should talk about that next next time. So. Anything else left to be said about light red oxide? So PR one hundred and one is the um, is the pigment code for light red oxide, I believe. Though there's a lot of different colors that are sold as PR one hundred and one, um, like burnt sienna, other ones, etc. Iron et oxide. Uh, which one? Iron oxide, right? Yeah, so it's an iron oxide. I think um, I had purchased a color, and you and you had said, "Yeah, that's all in the iron oxide field." Yeah, so, I like that color. Yeah. We'll mention that as we uh, come back into it, because there's so many variations of that. Um, why don't we? Yeah, move here's on? one. This is uh, M. Graham, which is actually another good brand. This is iron oxide here. And uh, this is a good brand. I mean, it's another good brand I would buy. I would say that a lot of those brands, I don't, and, it, and it's interesting because I don't want to go too far into the brands then at this point. But it no. seems like we're marketed with certain things, you know, like we are always hit with um, Cotman and other ones and M. Graham and the QOR, we don't hear much of. But, well, my um, concern when you buy any of these is the light fast. That, that's something we always are talking about. You know, I don't, you know, if it doesn't perform well on the paper, that's another story. But if you find out your painting is going to fade because it's facing a direct window, then you got a real problem. I think it's like Grumbacher, which is good paint. Don't get me wrong, but their alizarin is straight alizarin, and and it's it it's not light fast. It's it's fugitive color, so there's that concern. But let's let's get into alizarin crimson because that's on the Ron Ransom palette, and uh, we have debated this a lot. No, oh, it it was brought up in the Ron Ransom Disciples Facebook page. We had it in our own personal conversations. <laughs> Why don't you? give us a public service announcement about alizarin crimson mr benza well alizarin <laughs> crimson is a fugitive color i mean if you go back to like van gogh a lot of those paintings lost their color because the van the, the fugitive colors 
that's what they call them when they're not light fast, when they're exposed to sunlight, they will fade and you'll lose like that one we talked about moon glow. There was a talk about that color from Daniel Smith that it would fade if it was put in sunlight. So a lot of people started talking in the group like, oh, a lizard and crimson just blanketed is a fugitive color. And I started looking into that at that time. And I thought, OK, the Cotman student grades, if you look closely, you'll notice they say a lizard and crimson hue which yeah. means it's not necessarily actually true lizard and crimson. It's a combination of like dyes or pigments that create that color. Um, so that's what you've got to look for. Um, they do have permanent lizard and crimson, which is better light fast rated from some brands. But I've heard people say they feel like it's not quite the red that they were familiar with in using a So the, those, those are the concerns, but not all lizard is light light fast problems or fugitive color if you get the cotman all of the cotman line this is the great thing about cotman yeah. if you're just starting out the price isn't bad all of the colors are are hues or different pigments they're not they're non-toxic and uh, they're all light fast they're all highest light fast rated so that's why ron Ranson, i believe recommended those because he knew these are the great colors to start with you can't really go wrong and you're not going to spend a ton of money so that's yeah. really why to stay in that lane. Now, I um, when I started off with oils, uh, before I started taking classes in college, I had a three, four, two palette. Elizer and Crimson was one of them, but I didn't really go back to Elizer and Crimson with watercolor until the Ron Ransom palette, and I think until either Joe or Matt, either one of you, had posted some mixtures of it. Um, Matthew, yes, how do you use Elizer and Crimson on your palette? And how did, uh, how did Ron Ranson use it? I use I use a lizard and crimson for uh, for sky stuff. Like if I if I you know there's almost always like a crimson band of color in the sky here in North Texas. So you see, Posey Gaines use a lizard yeah. and crimson a lot. Well, he's he's not terribly far from me. He's over in Oklahoma. We have the same kind of sky, um, but. I use it in skies. I use it for the distant hills too. You know, I'll use a lizard and crimson quite a bit with um, ultramarine. Um, but that's, you know, I don't, it, a little of it goes a long way. In fact, I use it the least of all the colors on my palette. I would say the same for me, where a little bit in the sky and it doesn't get, you yeah. can take it to last forever. I think, yeah, I I, I, was, I thought about maybe using the lizard for my dark triad thing because that's what Alvaro uses, like uh, burnt umber, lizard, lizard and crimson and, and a blue when he wants to go really, really dark. Um, but yeah. I, I find that a lizard is so, it comes through it, and it'll pick up and come through everywhere. And, and even if you, you know, if you want to try to not use it, it's going to show up. You know, you want to not use it on your next five or six paintings. It still shows up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think mean... that Ron Ranson used it primarily to make like those mauve colors that he liked, that sort of purpley yes. pink kind of color was he, this he, main thing. He used it for storm clouds with the uh, Payne's Gray as well. Yeah. Why don't you use Payne's Gray, Matthew, for your darks instead of the bold? Because Payne's Gray is already like three colors. And I can't remember who told me this, but if you, if you start mixing more than four colors together, it's going to just be mud. And that's why I, I went with those three pure colors, that light red, the ultramarine, and the burnt umber, um, because it didn't give me that chalky you know, muddy, dull color that sometimes you can get with Payne's Gray. Yeah, that's interesting. I remember we had that conversation. That, um, that's why I started using like an indigo because it was a dark, but it, see, it's that, 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 that Payne's Gray, it's so dark that it looks weird on the paper if it ends up just on there by itself. And it also will get this thing that Andrew and I talked about, which is the bronzing effect yeah, where I your see. paper gets shiny. I call it chalky. You know, it looks like a chalkboard, chalk, you know, chalk dust. And, yeah. uh, and that's that's why I don't use it for my darks. I use it for 
uh, for green to make a dark green with, and I will use it for the uh, uh, for water sometimes and for um, sometimes for the storm clouds. But I don't I don't use it to make my darks and shadows, so to speak. Hmm. Yeah, with um with with paints gray. I I personally will use it in the sky. I'll use it as a dark. And I'd love it along the edge of land and water. Um, and I saw it on the palette by James Fletcher Watson. I mentioned him earlier. I paint's great is probably something that I go through a lot of. No. But you guys know I like that dark, uh, muddy, muted look. You um, use a lot of paints gray? Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm putting out fresh paint, and if I have to put out fresh paint, it is paints gray. The first thing wow. that's going. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Um, though you guys had mentioned cobalt blue earlier on some people's palettes. I've seen videos where uh, I think it was the American Watercolor Society where the gentleman was mixing cobalt blue with uh, black to make his paints gray. Yeah, so, I mean, that's that's basically what it is. It's yeah. like a, a mixture of a blue and. And, it's blue and black and, and potash soot and charcoal uh, yeah something like that that's why i don't use it to make my darks because you can't if you can't mix three other colors onto paints gray it's too many yeah. um so i also did find with paints gray that we have such we started using the word bronzing um joe had discovered that in handprint.com. Did, did you mention how, uh, what the solution was to bronzing? Because you had come up with a way to clean that. Well, one of the ways was to do that thing that uh, Turner did, which is they added like a milky white wash, you know, and they would make a little water with some wash and, and kind of go over that and it would weaken anything that was dark. Um, that's what Herman Peckle does. Yeah, yeah, he does that too. And so that's where I first got it. But of course, he he credited Turner. So, okay. um, you know, he said he used to use tea, I believe, in the one video. But uh, another thing I did, I would take a tissue that was wet, like a kitchen roll towel, and press it against there and lift away some of it if it got to be, you know, a bronzing effect. And then, of course, I was varnishing. I was trying some spray varnish on pieces um, just as another preservative way and not have to use a glass for framing. And that would make the whole piece obviously shiny. So the bronzing then was irrelevant, but it does stick out like a sore thumb. If you use like too heavy of darks and spots, it'll get that weird shine. But usually if you're just putting it on normally, you won't have a problem. But me, I kind of tend to layer and put it, I use a lot of paint. So I, I, un, I paint un, untraditionally, if that's a word non-traditionally <laughs> um so um matt you yep. moved away from Payne's gray right you have a mixture that you currently use right now the mixture oddly enough when you had first mentioned it at the beginning what was the color mixture that you're using what's the three colors burnt umber light red and ultramarine blue Okay, burn number, and then you had mentioned um, somebody else using one with the lizard and crimson, like a three color dark triad. Yeah, Alvaro, Alvaro Castagnay does that. Um, goes in with uh, burnt umber or some brown. It's, it's burnt sienna, I believe. Burnt sienna? I'm pretty sure. It, and he throws in a lizard and crimson and and another brown, I think. I'd have to go back and watch that video where he did that, but yeah, yeah. Uh, that's how he makes his darks. Yeah. And then sometimes if it's too dark, he'll splash on yeah. cobalt over the top, like yeah. a flick of cobalt to like kind of break it up. Well, here's a quick uh, Google uh, search because the original Payne's Gray was Crimson Lake. So Crimson Lake is a Lizarin, right? Yes. Uh, yellow ochre, which I can see how that might relate to your burnt umber. Eh. Nah. And, um, and iron blue, uh, Prussian blue yeah. was the original mix. 
for that. So essentially you're just using, you're kind of using that three color triad to make your gray, your dark, right? And Yeah, and I haven't abandoned paints gray. I just don't use it. I don't, when I go in to do my darks, I don't make my darks with paints gray. Um, you know, things that get paints gray don't always necessarily have to be dark in tone. And when yeah. I, I guess when I say my darks, I mean my heavy toned darks. You know, full I, I just feel dark. like the running theme for this con these conversations in these videos is just Matthew Clemens disdain for Payne's Gray. <laughs> that 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 just <laughs> for those I, of you I watching, don't dislike it. it. It's still on my palette. I, I have it. Yeah. Probably. Just, <laughs> well, I, we've both moved away from it, and you still like it. So I don't know. I may if, because you like it. I might go back to it. I use it for green. It's my it's my dark green. That's what I use it for. He's got out his palette. Look out. Yeah. That's that's a great thing we have to talk about that I always forget is that Payne's gray and lemon yellow or Payne's gray and raw sienna can mix those dark olive greens. Yes. Yeah. Raw I sienna is really a good that. green mixer. That's what makes You can also get the green from the burnt sienna and uh in Payne's Gray, can't you? I mean, because that, that sienna is in there and it comes through as a green. Really? Yeah. Because yeah, I, I always feel like the 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 burnt sienna is kind of a mixture between the raw sienna and the light red oxide, right? It, it, is, it is, but it has that sienna in it. Just because it, you know, it reads that dark, that darker red color doesn't mean that that yellow isn't in there, you know. But yeah. we should probably mention one other thing in that opacity. We haven't mentioned that yet. And one thing is raw sienna is very opaque and yellow ochre is not. Ye or, or raw sienna yeah. is not opaque. Yeah, right. And yellow ochre is. I is, switched yeah. that around. Yellow ochre is more opaque. So when you go over something, it's not going to be as transparent. And if you look at the paints you're buying and they have that, the manufacturer, They'll, they'll tell you, and for the most part, watercolor is transparent. That's why it, it, the medium is what it is. It's, you know, transparent painting. Even acrylics and certain oils are transparent too. But if you switch, like for me, I switched over. I found that yellow to be more, better for coverage because yep. of the opacity it's got, effect. It's got a heavier body for sure. Yeah. That's yeah, why I, I mess around with gouache, you know, is because yeah. like this one that's behind me here. I mean, I, I used acrylic wash on some of this and some of its watercolor because I'm trying to get certain effects. I can't get every effect out of one medium. So that's why I've kind of gravitated into mixed media because there's I can get certain things. Every every medium has its plus and minus, you know? Yeah. Well, let's go into raw sienna because that, that was part of the original Ron Ransom palette, right? That's like... Yes. A, Oh yeah, well, that's a big a big core of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the foundation of it. I would say personally, and that's I don't know if it's influenced by Stephen Cronin or David Usher. Those are the ones that had led me into. Um, I got a toy laser mouse for the cats running around. Sorry. <laughs> um, watching them, one of the first pigments that they put on their brush and onto the paper is raw sienna. I do, I do the same. My, Same here. My grandfather, who was a, a trained artist, also had a, a reverence for raw sienna. Um, it's just such a good color. That's actually an old masters thing, actually. A yellow or a yellow orangey color would be like the first thing that they would lay down on canvas. So that's before they built from. the foundation, you'll notice a lot of the old masters started with that. And then built up over the top to create a warmer start, a warmth to the to to yeah. you know the, the transparency. Yeah, um, I don't know if I'm confusing my Bob Ross with uh, with Ron Ranson, but I know Ron Ran uh, Bob Ross would say to lubricate the paper, but I think that Ron Ranson would do almost the same fashion, right, to warm it up to get it going. Well. Those Ron Ranson actually did. Things. Ron Ranson did use that word to lubricate the paper in big. He did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, 
Well, the they first... both do serve that purpose. You see, like Bob Ross got that from uh, uh, Bill Alexander, Alexander, where he discovered that if you put this slick sheen on the paper, it would assist in blending. And then, of course, he developed over the years a combination of this way to thin this white because he, he knew that you mix white in, in oil painting all the time anyway. So why not put this slick surface of white on the canvas and then as you mix in, everything will blend. That's the purpose of, here are these, like th these are, this is golden open, this is, this is an open acrylic and they're meant to not dry so you can do a blending technique. And uh, that's why you hear the, like the term lubricate, like Ron did it and having that little bit of paint, I've tried it with white and watercolor, it does work, but it makes a pastel looking painting, but, also in, in watercolor, if you put something on first, it's like it, it kind of binds the colors to the paper. And it's a good color to start with, to build on top of. And, and it makes your voids warmed up, you know, so you don't have these totally white, you know, whatever your paper is. I um, actually experienced that for a while in the beginning with um, the application that I did with the hake brush washing David Usher. I would deliberately leave a lot of white voids. Um, I, I personally moved away from that. And I, I enjoy just having that complete undertone where you don't have those issues. Um, but if you have, okay, so let's talk about mixing with raw sienna since it's so important, it, it is the foundation. Um, Matthew, why don't you lead us through uh, just mixtures, uh, mixtures of raw sienna with other colors? Rossi, and what do you uh, use it for? Uh, I uh, take take the bright lemony yellow off of uh, yellow areas with a touch of raw sienna. So when I put, go in to put like lemon yellow somewhere, instead of using it just by itself, where it can kind of look a little fluorescent, I'll do a touch of raw sienna on it. Uh, I can get good good oranges like uh, bracken color and feel of. Uh, dried or chopped fields with um, raw sienna and light red mixed together. Um, and there's a great green that, uh, that comes out of raw sienna with both Payne's gray and raw sienna with ultramarine. I get good green out of that. Um, and I always put the raw sienna out first. I always do that. Yeah. Always. Uh Joe, why don't you uh, walk us through? Oh, well, you, okay, raw sienna, uh, yellow ochre. Currently, if you had to choose one, which one would you go with? More than likely the yellow ochre. I just like, it, it's just a little different of a yellow. The raw sienna is, does not, it, it's not like an, a color that you'd go to on its own, but yellow ochre is yeah i would use raw sienna as a as a color i would use it as you've described it as a as a uh, you know combiner but it, it on its own that's all i would really use it for i actually wouldn't mix other colors with it maybe greens but honestly i don't like mixing greens i wish there was there, there unfortunately there isn't any too many good greens but i've been working with like i'll take up green and then i'll add something to it but you know, you're working in the palette, you're going blue and yellow, and you're trying to make greens and paints gray, and you're dirty in one by touching the other. And I just, I, I really don't like making greens. I, I'll sound like a heretic, but I don't really like mixing colors too much. <laughs> I, I like maybe doing a combo of them on the paper, but I'm not really a big paint mixer, like sitting down all oh, getting the right color. I like to find colors that are good out of the tube that work for me. Like if you go to like Daniel Smith, they do have some good greens. They have something called an undersea green. I don't know if you remember talking about that, but it's like a very yeah. unique color on its own. And then they might have something like a turquoise and you can use that as a wash. Or I like using colors that are like really nice and independent on their own that I don't have to mix too much into, you know, and you get into that mud thing when you start mixing too many anyway, but I just mixing colors. It's a, it's a lot of effort. I'm sort of the lazy man's painter, which is probably why I like doing things quickly, you know? So the closer I can get to a color I like out of the tube, um, the better. Well, 
Um, I would say this. So it, this kind of relates back to what um, Matt was saying earlier, I believe, where when you get to four pigments mixed, you start to get that mud taking place. Um, mm -hmm. we, we talked about wanting to get to the point with painting earlier, and you are essentially saying you like the convenience colors. You like to be able to put the paint out and go for it. Um, yeah. There's other painters out there, I guess, like kind of colorist. And, and there is like a huge section of painters in watercolor that are probably might be bigger than the fast and loose area. Definitely, definitely yeah. bigger. Yeah. Where they have their 30 color palettes. And, and this isn't knocking them. This is just like a different breed of painter where yeah. they will sit there and meticulously look for that color to match that rock or that um, that flower, you know. Um, but I don't think it's in any of us with our with our blood, with the way that we approach mm -hmm. things. Well, pastel painters, I mean, they have like thousands of sticks of different colors because mixing isn't quite, there's layering, but there's not mixing. So for those, and I did work with pastels for a while, you want something as close as possible to the color you need. And you'll have a big box of all these little pastel chalk sticks, you know, that, you know, you just, you want to get as close as humanly possible. Oh, yeah. Now, um, before we move on to the next, next color, a little uh, trivia, because you guys have probably went really in depth with all the Ron Ranson books. I believe there is a book where Mr. Ranson talks about people that came to visit him and they went out and they painted along a little river or a water stream right by his house, right? Didn't he live right on one? Uh, or am I making that in up? In his videos, he did go by a couple of streams. I don't know if, yep. well, there was one where it looked like he was standing on his balcony and painting the sky. So I wouldn't be surprised if he did have some scenery nearby where he lived. Um, I know he had moved to Oregon for a while. I don't know how scenic it was there. I've got, uh, I've got two pictures, originals of Ron Ranson, and one of them is indeed uh, the River Y which was his, before he moved to America. Um, so, and then I've got a picture of the, of the river, I guess, outside of where they lived in Oregon. I've got two originals, both, both of them are paintings of rivers, one American and one English. First of all, that is absolutely amazing that you have those. <laughs> and I think we should do a whole video just like, get that picture up on the screen and us just look about at it and talk about it because yeah. that is so cool. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I couldn't have a nicer person own those things. That's, that's awesome that you own those. Yeah. But in one of his books, I think he had sent some people out. They came to visit, they went to paint one of those rivers and they I came think back. That's at, in in uh, fast watercolor, fast and loose. Yeah, and he comes back. And do you remember what they say to him or what they ask him in the book? No. They, they, they come back and say, uh, how do you deal with all those greens? How do you deal with all that oh, foliage? Yeah, all those greens. Right. Uh, Matthew, yeah. don't you have the coveted sword in the stone? Don't you have the brush? Yeah, I do. Where is that brush? Right here. This is it. This is, this is one of Ron's personal brushes. That's amazing. Just a Beautiful chiseled edge. Look at that. I have to admit this to y'all that this is my daily brush. Uh, I use it without any shame at all. I paint with Ron's brush on a daily basis. So, so the Excalibur is uh, being used. That's right. <laughs> what, what he had they, one that they... he had for like 10 years in one of his videos where the dog chewed it up. Yeah, he all did. The handles eaten up. Somebody has that. Yeah. I don't know if it was the uh, person from our group. I'm not mentioning their name, but they filmed that three video. Don't uh -huh. they have that brush or something? Somebody has that brush. Somebody's got that brush. I don't know the story on it, though. But 10 years he had it. <laughs> thanks to Mike Porter, I have this brush. Mike Porter, that's it. Yeah. I have yeah. Ron's, one of Ron's brushes. This is the medium Ron Ranson Hake. That's my favorite size too. That's yeah, great. I, I do like the medium. Portfolio. I don't think you need a small. The medium is uh, more than the more than is, uh, 
Yeah. Medium can do pretty much any size work is is what I've what I've found. But I like yeah. the torch too. So yeah. Well, we have two colors left on the palette. Um, yeah. And I want to go back to those relics at like another video because I, I think we should just have a video of relics because that'd be so awesome. Yeah. Um, there's the light yellow, the lemon yellow, which I absolutely despise, and the burnt umber. So I want to bite the bullet and go into lemon yellow. Um, <laughs> I'll start off, us off with this and why I despise it. If I look at lemon yellow, it pushes green. Like, uh, you were this saying that uh, alizarin crimson will stay on your paper for days or without even using it. Mm -hmm. Lemon yellow will turn green and not stay the way it wants. I don't know if it's because I'm using what brands I'm using, but that that is me. And I, it, I rarely it use polluted. it. It's easily polluted. Easily contaminated lemon and yellow. Yeah. Is. Yeah. Um, I know we mentioned mixing it for yellow, uh, for greens. And when we labeled the, put the colors out, you did mention cadmium yellow as an alternative, which we had talked about opacity. Cadmium yellow, I believe, do you find that's a little bit more opaque? Warmer. And it's warmer, more kind of an orangey red tone, like, right? It's, it's warmer. I like the warmth of it personally, but it's not really yellow, but it does look like yellows you'd find in a landscape that's why i like it lemon yellow does not really and it does contaminate easily so yeah. I, I really don't use too much of the lemon yellow i'd rather use like a cad yellow or the uh, other ones what do we have gamboge hansa hansa yeah. is another good one that gamboge is fantastic and i don't know why that wasn't well i guess it makes sense why it wasn't an original palette to make everything really minimized. But um, Hansa, I've never used that. Would you go into detail about Hansa yellow or did you really experiment with that? I've uh, used I've used it. It's it's a brighter yellow. Um, I, I can't really comment too much more on it from there, but the, the gamboge is more of like a mustardy yellow. It's just different, different yellows. Like I say, instead of having to mix, I'll go to, if I have one, there's also azo yellow, A-Z-O. And that's almost like lemon, but it's very bright yellow. I think that's what, uh, over at um, Cheap Joe's, I think that's what Joe's yellow is. Is that possible? Really? Because if you look at color charts, the brands will have so many different yellows. They'll yeah. have the lemon yellow, the I guess just the yellow, Indian yellow. There's a huge range of them. We really don't ever touch them. Indian no. yellow is good, though. I've seen people use that with, you know, very good success. And then there's also primary yellow. It's another variation on the yellows. Hmm. So... Um, Matt, you had mentioned um, Cheap Joe's yellow. Is that just the tube that you've used or? Uh, Cheap Joe has, a, well, Thalo Blue over at Cheap Joe's in the American Journey is Joe's Blue. And then Joe, and then it has a complement of Joe's Yellow the, of, of the American Journey uh, paints. And um, I think that I've, I've used the Joe's yellow and it's, uh, I think it's that Azol yellow. Yeah, actually I like that Joe's yellow. It, yeah, yeah I wonder why. <laughs> Joe, where is it? I know I still have a tube of it. While you look for that, um, we, could get, uh, we could get Joe Menta sponsored by Cheap Joe's. How does that sound? <laughs> no, right, well, I have, you know, I have you Joe's. Do. Joe's Cad There's Yellow Cheap Joe's. Light, which I, I highly recommend. This this one right here. It's a good yellow. Yeah. Joe's Cad Yellow Light. But, Here's um, the sponsorship. You want to, the hate brushes that are Cheap Joe's. See, they print their, they print on yeah. them, the large and the medium. Nice. Those are nice looking. Yeah, they're fine. They just, they get them from Pro Art and they just have their imprint on there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have to we have to move on to burnt umber 
because we got to wrap it up pretty quick. It looks like. Yeah, we got to pretty soon. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. Um, no problem. Yeah, so, so lemon yellow, uh, just toss the tube out the window. <laughs> <laughs> I think okay so uh Matt hates uh Payne's gray with a passion <laughs> I have a disdain for lemon yellow let's move on to burnt umber um uh, I absolutely love burnt umber me too I mean it is just such a a beautiful color that you can get you can get all the tone all the varieties in tone with burnt umber I mean, you it can was, bright, you know, bright and lively, and burnt umber can be dark, you know. And it's a must-have, really. Yeah, it's a must-have. It's, it's a must-have, and if you mix it with ultramarine, it's like the best thing ever. It's the best thing ever. Hence, that's why it's prominently positioned in Matthew's dark triad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we are going to get Matthew's dark triad um, on shelves to an art store near you at some point, right? I'm going to be trying it actually. I'm going I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm to be. I'm going to try the bowl. I'm getting a bowl as we get speak. you. A, get you a bowl and just do it. You know, Stephen Cronin style. Just put it. Put the four, the three corners of the bowl heavy with the uh, with your colors and and I do recommend you let it dry. You know, overnight or a day or two before you start really gumming it up. Otherwise, wow. it just stirs up completely. I'm yeah, gonna I, I, I need something that's a go-to dark. I like that idea of making certain things that are ready to go. And you know what's cool about it is if you need it to be a cool dark, you just you work on that side. If you need it to be a warm dark, you work over by the side with the light red. Um, and that's here. This this whole thing here. I show you this painting really quickly. While he's grabbing that painting, I do want to say this: um, burnt umber for anybody that's going on vacation going out sketching that's the one tube to have when you're you can only have one tube yeah, you I, can, I would yeah. Say, hands down yeah you can do a one you can do a whole painting with just that color yeah, yeah. i mean i have um i've actually sold burn umber studies really I, people like burn umber yeah. but like okay oh, yeah. so so here's this painting here um but if if I want cool dark, I pulled it right out of the, the blue side. Oh, that's a big one. Yeah. This is the side I didn't realize it was that big lately. when you posted it. Yeah, I've been painting on the big sizes lately. That I like that one. Yeah, but you can get uh, you know, warm darks and cool dark from that triad. Wow. I yeah. do like that painting. Thank you. That's fantastic. And it seems like a great recommendation to beginners to have Matthew Clemens TM for each color try a dark. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> this, this, these colors are the dark triad there. <laughs> the ultramarine, the, the uh, burnt umber and the light red there. But what I'm getting at is if you start off with that triad as a beginner, and like you said, you're, you, what side would you go for your cooler and for your lighter? You'd go for your ultramarine, right? Yeah, you're over on the blue side, staying, you know, you're at the blue and the brown for the for the uh, cool side. And if you want dark, warm darks, then you're over there with the red and the ultramarine. Do you think that that would be a good beginning palette? I mean, we've talked about a seven color palette with the Ron no, Ransom palette. No, I don't think it's a good beginner's palette. I think it's when you... When you have everything in order and you you have all the kinds of colors you like and everything, you need to know what that you need your dark recipe. You have to have, and that dark recipe comes later. Once you've been able to like put a put a painting out with your tones, and you, then you have to come in on the end and really lay in dark heaviness. That's a little bit of an advanced activity. So I would say it's for intermediate when you step it up you get that dark recipe. Yeah. And a lot of times you don't even realize you needed those darks until your other colors started drying, which is why you yeah. guys like the dark That's in this correct. medium. And, um, well, I mean, like if we go back way to the beginning of this conversation, uh, one thing that Matthew had said was the looking at the colors, then creating a palette and jumping into composition and learning that. Yeah. Um, and, and that was what I think 
Matthew at the beginning found very important. I'm not uh, trying to put words in anybody's mouth, just kind of thinking of a flow of things for people that are watching and that are because, you know, people on Ron Ranson disciples are going to watch and ask questions. But it seems to be that flow that's a place for you. Um, and I know we want to wrap this up soon, but I know that Joe modified with a dark. Did you want to go into that or save that for another day? Well, I found I like going to a more red dark than a blue dark. And so I was, I found like a, Ma a Daniel Smith and the Masters Touch, they have a indigo. I had discovered indigo and I thought this is really great for darks. And so I started looking for indigos in other mediums too, because I liked it so much, but uh, it's not an easy color to find. But when I started looking, looking at the pigments that made it up then i started being coming concerned with light fastness so um i i don't know i'm, I'm still on the fence with it and I, after this though as soon as i shut the camera off i'm going to be making up a whole batch of matthew clemens trademark patented bowl <laughs> dark mix <laughs> so um just to kind of i guess lead us off then uh Real quick, you guys have any um, Ron Qu Ranson questions for me? You think that anything that I didn't talk about with the palette? No? All right. <laughs> well, how about, we, how about we answer this? Wet or dry, Joe? Wet or dry? Oh, oh. Um, you know, wet is preferable if you can keep a wet palette. But when I'm sitting there painting, my paint's dry while I'm painting. So... Yeah. I've been starting to squeeze out. You'll see in some of my videos, I squeeze out right on top of my uh, easel. I have a little plastic area and I'll squeeze right there to get it fresh. So uh -huh. I, I would say I would rather have it wet, but if you need to travel, I mean, there's nothing wrong with a dry palette, but you just got to scrub and, there's you know, wear out your bristles. Palette, but uh, I, I prefer squeezing right out from the tube. That's the way I've been doing it for a while now, for years at this point. Um, yeah. But that doesn't mean that I don't, you know, if I, if I go in to do some painting and I'm not really going to get deep into it, that I don't use the re-wetted and dried stuff on the palette. Uh, but if I am going to set in to try to do something specific, I squeeze wet out onto the palette. Yeah, yeah. and there's a benefit to squeezing your paint out. Like if you're going to work with your sky and you go, okay, I'm going to use this, this, and this and squeeze a little bit out. It, you're kind of focused on just that and that's all you're going to use instead of looking back at the palette kind of jumping around it actually creates more of a plan going yeah. forward and then you squeeze out what you need in the next part um, there's something more deliberate about it yeah i think that's an important really important thing that we talked about not using alizarin crimson at times not using Payne's gray not using others where you don't even need to use those full seven colors no but no, you uh, don't. yeah, you know, that's um, I think that's something that gets overlooked very easily that maybe some people might get overwhelmed by those seven at first. And uh, it, Joe's approach of putting those out is a great suggestion. It's certainly well, I actually recommend people using the burnt umber off, right off the bat and just doing burnt umber paintings. Uh, that was my first thing I did with Frank Clark when I got his hake brush, and I think that that is. You do two or three or four of those just to get your, you know, wet. But I always tell people to say, um, to get your beak wet, I should say. But I, I always tell people, because I know they're going to go in the store and they're going to buy, we did it. We bought the basic thing, buy yeah. a basic set of paints and, and play with that for a little while. So I don't, I, I try to keep it simple so people don't get overwhelmed and buy, buy a basic set, use some of the colors you like out of there. Don't worry about the colors too much because you can mix mostly anything you want out of even those sets, even though some of those colors are kind of garish looking, but you can make those sets work. So those are usually like five or seven paints. I don't think it's too overwhelming. It's not like these sets you go in and buy at Hobby Lobby and it's like, there's 300 colors in here, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I think that would be the best palette advice that we could probably recommend is to save that initial $30 that you would drop on a set of 30, I would think, right? Or yeah, go out and get yourself a tube of burnt umber. I mm -hmm. say you spend, you get a coupon, you go to Hobby Lobby and you spend $5 on that one set of watercolor paint. And you start with that. If you're a beginner, just to see if you like it. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. Yeah, because I remember I, I kind of like the pastel thing where you look at it and you're like, oh, well, I want this, I want that. And then you suddenly you have a 64 color set and you're in over your head. Yeah. Yeah, it's I hard mean, to make consistent got work when you have that many color choices too. Yeah. You know, it starts to starts to be hard to be consistent because you think, oh, well, which one of my 20 yellows did I find that I, I like this for this flower or whatever? And you'll find some of your best paintings that you feel the proudest about or you like the most are ones where you only use three colors. Absolutely. Limited palette. Yeah. Yeah, that really is a good test of skill, too. Um, so we're all old men. We got to make our way to bed, right? Uh, yeah. Let's get some closing statements. Um, Matthew, you want to start closing us off? Uh, yeah, well, next time we're going to talk about how to get, how to, how to make sure you don't quit, whether it be from money or having, not having the, the space you think you need or, uh, you know, the ability to, to choose your art materials. I think we ought to talk about that next time. All right. I, I, I think that's fantastic because yeah. um, helping people get into it without, I mean, well, that's a big thing that uh, Joe has been looking at is, and, and he is a big proponent of the best way to get beginners into it. So I don't know if we mentioned this, by the way, um, before we go to Joe, Matthew, uh, do you have any social media, anything you want to share uh, so people can check you out? Me? Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm an admin at the Ron Ransell's Disciples Group on Facebook. Uh, and that is the pretty much the extent of my social media activity is through that group. But I do on my personal page, you know, a lot of, you, you get, we all have all these mutual friends really all over the world. It's pretty interesting when you look on and see, you know, all the different people that are connected. But um, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram as Clemens Watercolors. Okay, so uh, C L E M O N S watercolors. Yes. Mm -hmm. I send him a follow because uh, he is probably all over the world posting pictures from all the, over the world as well. Um, Joe, I started talking about like we were just leading into how you're a big proponent of ways for beginners to start. Why don't you tell us about your social media? as we sign off and where people can see all of your stuff and all of your tips that you have out there. Well, I did buy my own name, joemenza.com. I figured I may as well get it. It was available. So I, I have everything there that you can go to. And I put up the, my newest videos that I have there and my videos are all about, you know, fun and, you know, bringing people in. And of course there's a component we don't talk about, but you'll hear about it in, um, the anxiety factor. Um, it's, it's a very, painting is a very great way, no matter what medium that you use, really to take your mind off of things and, you know, kind of relax and sit down and just have a good time, put on your headphones and paint. And for me, because I found this later in life, it's like, you always say, I wish I'd have discovered this sooner. And so that's why you want to kind of pass this along. I, I, everybody looks fondly at the people that started them we mentioned Stephen Cronin and some of the other people and Bob Ross and things you know it's not that they're like the greatest artists that ever came along the pike but they shared something as a gift in a way that we could take on and we appreciate that there's an appreciation level of that someone gave us that enjoyable gift and that's my contribution to it I know um, that's what I do on my videos and painting stuff like that. And I have a cousin really that recently started picking up. He was actually a guitar player and uh, he started, he joined the group recently and um, he started painting and he just, he loves it. And he's constantly oh, sending me messages with questions and things like that. But I told him exactly what I said here, start simple, you know, and just enjoy, have fun. Don't worry about the outcome. Even if you're just splashing color on paper, you know, just get that, get that feel for it and just take your time and enjoy, you know? Yeah. So, um, I think after this, I'm going to go by, uh, 
cheapjoemenza.com. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to trademark that name. I'm going to get Cheap Joes and Joe Menza. Oh, my gosh. Post. Yeah. And, that um, sounds like a trolling site. Don't give anybody <laughs> any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. Um, but like uh, Matthew said, uh, we'll come back next time with conversations on when we talked about the palette. We'll talk about how we can get, how people can get and started into it. Um, because like you said, a lot of people say they started so late in life. In fact, Ron Ranson said that he had started kind of late in life and came up with these methods or at least this approach to get to that ang angle uh, quicker. Um, so that, that's what we'll have next time. And eventually down the line, if we can get some of our, um, the elderly generation, the generation above us, the people that taught us that are still around to come onto this and uh, chat with us. That would be fantastic. Yeah, be cool. yeah a lot of these guys are in England, so we'd have to kind of stay up late, you know, but uh, I'd yeah. be willing to do it, especially yeah. Dave Usher. I mean, he's really a master in a lot of different uh, mediums, you know, that, uh, and he's very prolific in his videos. I mean, he's a master. He's, artist, he puts out yeah. videos daily. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, if we can um, start reaching out to those, and uh, I, I think, People would love to hear them talk as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, if you guys have nothing else to say, anybody want to sign us off and say goodbye? I just checked in Matthew's triad and Matthew's dark triad.com are available. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for me. All I'm right. out. I'm going out on a high note. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next time then. All right. Thank you, you all guys. take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.